Good evening, everybody. I can. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us here tonight. I'm Jonathan Overpeck. I'm the Dean of the School for Environment and Sustainability. Um, and it's great to be doing another event uh, with a really distinguished speaker. Um, as a climate scientist, uh, the focus tonight is one that is near and dear to my heart. I am grateful you are all here for the important discussion on the critical moment in the planet's future. And I know we've all been uh, striking and figuring out how to get to carbon neutrality here and in the city, and there couldn't be a better speaker to help inform what we're doing and sort of give us a backdrop of what's happening in the nation and globally. Um, tonight's lecture marks the second event in our year-long commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Earth Year, uh, which launched here, you'll hear this a lot over this year, which launched first here in uh, Ann Arbor uh, with teach-ins on the environment at the University of Michigan. Throughout the year, we'll be hosting events just like this one, so keep an eye out. Um, and visit earthday.mich.edu to learn about the additional events. That's something I would follow closely. So I think on some days, like today, there are actually two events, which was something we're going to try and avoid in the future. Um, and now, uh, to why we are here. Uh, the world today is facing unprecedented, interconnected environmental and sustainability challenges. The global scale of the climate change challenge makes it the threat to our, of our time. To prevent planetary climate disaster, we must all work together and quickly. Achieving a sustainable future requires global efforts that are ambitious and action-oriented. It requires solution that com solutions, plural, that combine public policy, engineering, public health, business, behavior, sciences, and the humanities. The challenge requires societal transformation of a scale and rapidity that has rarely been achieved. When's the last time we were able to pull this off? It's really in the 1930s and 40s uh, when we were, had the challenge of the Depression and then World War II. What enabled action at that time was a perceived existential threat and broad support in society. So we have the threat now, but we don't have the full support, and that's what we're working really hard on. Today, we are faced with such a threat, um, but the widening wealth disparities and special interests are impeding the needed change. The solution to the climate crisis thus requires a strong commitment to equity and justice to indigenous peoples and future generations and to a global transformation that vastly increases the number of those who benefit while dramatically reducing the numbers of those who do not. So when we were coming out of the Great Depression, going into World War II, it was essentially the belief that everybody would benefit by pulling together on it. And so that's what we need now going forward. While the challenge can feel daunting at times, I'm inspired by the momentum that's been building in recent months and weeks. I'm inspired by our youth who took to the streets to lead us in the global climate strike to demand, to demand urgent action. I'm inspired by the fearless 16-year-old, old plural, like Greta Thunberg, who are taking previous generations and global leaders to task, who are joining us in the fight for our future. And I hope you all saw or listened to her speech at the UN Climate Action Summit last week. She was phenomenal. And there are even more reasons for optimism in my, my eyes. As indicated in the title of tonight's talk, Clean Energy Revolution is here. The cost of renewable energy continues to drop, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about this. Just look at the cost of solar as an example. According to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the cost of utility scale solar has dropped from $5.50 per watt to $1.10 per watt between 2010 and 2018, a nearly 80% reduction in cost. And prices continue to plummet. This is why coal is out of business. And this is why natural gas will soon be out of business. 
with the, I hope Dan says the same thing. <laughs> or I've been fooled. Um, with the global challenge comes unprecedented opportunity. Now is the time to rise to the challenge and move forward in making global transition a reality and to do it in a way that is equitable and just. To do it in a way that curbs climate change while sparking innovation and economic opportunity. To launch the environmental movement of the 21st century and beyond. Here at the University of Michigan, we're examining how we can make the transition through the President's Commission on Carbon Neutrality. Our goal is to achieve carbon neutrality on all our campuses as soon as possible. That won't be easy, but we have tremendous obligation to correct the course of our planet for our inhabitants and generations to come. We have an obligation to all, on campus and off, to work together and get the job done. And tonight, it's my honor to introduce a global thought leader in energy and policy solutions that can get us to a more sustainable future. Dr. Dan Kamen is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, with parallel appointments in the Energy and Resources Group, where he serves as chair. This is a very famous group and the Goldman Sachs School of Public Policy, where he directs the Center for Environmental Policy and the Department of Nuclear Ener Engineering. We gotta ask him about that, eh? Um, Kamen is also the founding director of Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory and was director of the Transportation Sustainability Research Center from 2007 to 2015. In 2010, Dan was appointed by Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton as the first energy fellow of the Environment and Climate Partnerships for the Americas initiative. This guy's an overachiever. He began service as science envoy to the, for the US Secretary of State John Kerry in 2016, but resigned over President Trump's policies and actions in August 2017. He's going to talk about this today, but if you haven't checked it out on the web already, um, he has wrote a scathing letter, um, and it really impresses me with his clear and compelling sense of what is right and what is wrong. Here are just a few numbers that illustrate Dan's impressive track record and scientific contribution. He has helped found over 10 companies. He has authored or co-authored 12 books. He has written over 300 peer-reviewed journal publications. And did I say he's an overachiever? <laughs> and he has testified more than 40 times to US state and federal congressional briefings. And he's provided various governments with more than 50 technical reports. He's a frequent contributor and commenter in the international news media, including Newsweek Time, New York Times, The Guardian, and The Financial Times. He also shares my appreciation for using Twitter to engage the public in conversations around science. You can follow him at Dan underscore Kamen. He's a permanent fellow of the African Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy for the Advanced, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Physical Society. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dan Kamen to the University of Michigan. Sit and listen. Thank you. That was glorious. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dean Peck, thank you for those incredibly kind words. Thank you all for attending tonight. And in particular, thank you to everyone who's here as part of the University of Michigan US China conference, which has really been a fascinating dialogue and something I'll refer to a little bit as we as we go today. So I just I want to start off with the, the kind of statement that you don't get to make all the time as an academic and that this is really the time to choose. Those of us who have been working on energy and sustainability for decades recognize that there is a huge movement afoot and people who are new to the field who didn't have to or didn't rise up at a time when Solar was too expensive, as you heard a comment before. And we weren't thinking about battery technology. 
and we didn't recognize all you could get from energy efficiency, and we didn't recognize that clean energy and biodiversity and human rights were one and the same. This is an amazing time to go into the field for anyone who is an undergraduate, who is partway through graduate school, who is sort of interested to be corrupted in what is going to be the fight of this century. And so I want to try to highlight a number of those features and really kind of point out, in my opinion, why the choices that one makes about your major or about are you more technical, non-technical, narrative-based, quantitative-based, that's all interesting to meet your own needs. But the sustainability movement needs people working in all areas. And we couldn't quite say that the same way a decade or two decades ago. And I hope that story comes out tonight as well. So I'm really hoping that this is more than anything an invitation and a rallying call to the kind of work we critically have to do. And finally, there's a movement to do it. So as you heard, I direct a laboratory at Berkeley. It's called RAIL. Um, we post there not just the academic articles, but a lot of the Senate testimonies. We're involved in a number of very public battles around clean energy in Southeast Asia, in East Africa, in China, in the United States, and with a whole variety of partners. And you do need to put in some qualifier like Berkeley or my name, because if you just Google rail, you'll find the Raelians, and they cloned a human a decade ago, and I haven't heard a lot from them since, so leaving them aside. Um, and then as you heard from, from Dean Peck, um, I'll highlight a couple things on Twitter. Um, I always promise I would only tweet once a day, but the last month has been so exceptional. I've been sort of a Twitter diarrhea. Um, but I'll highlight a couple of those bits as we go. And so what I'd like to, to, to discuss is a little bit about the climate opportunity, the climate crisis we're in. This is when everyone who's an expert should go to sleep for 7.2 minutes, and everyone else hopefully will get something out of it. And then I want to look a little bit at how we're able to leverage the infrastructure challenges we face in every country, both those that have old decaying infrastructure, like the United States, and those that are building new infrastructure to make better choices than we made in the past. And that will lead to the final part where I want to talk a little bit about the nexus of data science and the thing that has really captured the conversation in California and in a number of the groups we work with around the world. And that's really the nexus of sustainability and social justice. And I'll highlight that more in words than in numbers and data. But that's one of the places we're going back to the website. We'll give you, hopefully, quite a bit more on this. And so I want to start with the climate crisis opportunity story. And while in educated audiences like this, everyone, of course, is up on the latest climate science, and none of you in the room have a ornery uncle or aunt who thinks rocks falling into the ocean are the source of sea level rise, or it's really a, a Soviet or a Chinese or a Martian plot. And so for everyone else who doesn't have um, a crazy relative, you don't need the next um, 19 seconds. But one of the challenges that the climate movement has faced in the past is been, it's been very, very academic. It has other issues, like it's been very, very white, and I'll get to some of those things later on. But its overly academic start didn't help it form a very clear uh, PR campaign to how to get the word out. So for anyone who is involved in any of those uncomfortable Thanksgiving conversations with that crazy Uncle Laurent, you need ammunition that doesn't come from someone's model. You need basic data to highlight the story. And so what I want to show is a synthetic movie. You can download it from the NASA website. If you just look at sea ice minimum, you can, you can pull this up. And I find this my go-to item over and over again because there's no modeling involved in it at all. What you're going to see is a few seconds of movie that just shows the amount of sea ice over the North Pole, but taken each year at the point when the sea ice is at its minimum. And so that's sometime in late August, early September. It varies based on the climate change. But it'll give you an, a, 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 the extent of the ice. And for anyone who has seen the movie Chasing Ice, you know that when you melt a big pile of ice, you don't just lose its area, you lose its volume, it pancakes down. And so it's a particularly useful way to, if I can do it right, 
to give you a feeling for that story. And so this will be from 1979 up until the present when we had almost uh, well, 7 million kilometer, square kilometers of ice over the North Pole. And of course, even melting all that ice doesn't change sea level because if you have a melting ice in a cup, you don't change the level due to the density difference. But what you can see there are warmer and cooler years. But in the early 2000s, this data dropped off the chart. And so today, we have roughly half as much ice as we had only a few decades ago. And the global impacts of that are stunning in terms of fish populations, health of whales. Turns out killer whales are doing remarkably well. That's an interesting uh, side note in the story. Um, a lot of whales' prey tend to hide on the edge of the ice, and as it retreats, um, it's been uh, happy hunting for killer whales and not so happy for narwhals and belugas and spine, et cetera. But this gives you a model-free, keep your uncle or aunt quiet version of the story that is really critical as the backstory for understanding what we need to do. Now, for decades doing a climate talk, we'd spend a lot of time on this. But thankfully, we have moved on, except for those cranky relatives, um, in terms of understanding where we are. And one of the two most iconic moments of the battle to understand and deal with climate change comes in this picture here from 2014 when President Obama and, and President Xi met at the APEC summit one year before the Paris Climate Agreement and essentially said the following. We are the G2 of pollution. We are, at that point, 40% of global energy use, 40% of pollution. If we come up with an agreement that the US and China can live with, we will have solved the story. And of course, every European said, that's a total fabrication of the past. We in Europe have been working hard on this for a long time, and it's true. Japan said we were the leaders in energy efficiency and solar, that is true. But essentially, the US and China seized the day and set up a treaty that most of my political science friends said doesn't even make sense as a treaty. It was asymmetric in a whole variety of ways. The US, under President Obama, agreed to cut emissions by one-third by 2025 under the Clean Power Plan, and China agreed to peak emissions by 2030. Not the same year, not the same goal, and furthermore, the Chinese goal was to peak meaning the slope of the curve is zero, but whether that was at exactly where it was today, 10% higher, 1,000% higher, that wasn't specified. So now we have to fast forward to 2019. China will most likely peak its emissions several years in advance of that 2030 goal. And countries, let me tell you, do not normally meet their treaty obligations early. And the US, of course, has had a little election issue, and We've, we've backed out of the, of the climate treaty. And so the asymmetries have worked in ways very different than we initially, uh, we initially discussed. And we have some people in the room who helped negotiate part of the treaty. This is essentially what happened as a result of the very good work in Europe. I don't want to anger too many Europeans in the room too much. But this is the agreement that went into the Paris, um, the, into the Paris Climate Accord, where this was the path we were on. Business as usual, we had other names for it at different times in the past. I won't mention the Bush as usual. Um, but that was the path we were on. And essentially with the US-China uh, agreement and the agreements that were being hammered out in the EU and elsewhere, we collectively agreed to cut that orange or reddish um, wedge or triangle out of our emissions through the commitments made by different countries. And the history of the, of the climate conferences, um, I see some people in the room who have been to almost as many of them as I have, were not a thing of beauty. They agreed to very little up until the Paris Accord. And what happened at the, in the Paris meeting was diversity. Some countries said they would double or triple down on efficiency. Others said renewable energy. Others said preserving mangroves. Others said rainforests. And that opening of the conversation allowed a very different dialogue around what it meant to meet your climate agreements. So those are the national direct uh, commitments that we've agreed to. Now we're four years out. Um, we're on our way to the big meeting in Santiago, Chile, where people have, countries have to come clean as to how little they've done to get there. There are some success stories, but remarkably few. But down here, this gray area is 
the needed innovations. So already you know right off that the requirement to keep innovating and in fact to innovate much faster, not just in the basic science, basic policy, basic behavioral economics, basic community engagement level, needs to speed up, but we also need to partner in ways to spread much more rapidly with much fewer failures than our past efforts have been. And that alone is a huge and probably unmeetable challenge. But what it means is that partnerships between engineers, economists, people in environmental justice, in gender studies, in land use, in all kinds of areas are going to have to kick the tires very quickly on a, on a wide range of features to make this happen. Now, one of the interesting events of the Paris Climate Ag Agreement was that it was so successful so fast that very quickly a coalition came together, and I see one of the architects in the room, of a second treaty, the so-called Kigali Accords, which shave another half degree off, largely through refrigerants and industrial efforts. And so we go from being on this uh, business as usual to a path, if we did what we all said, to give us a fighting chance. That was 2015. As of today, one country is on pace to meet their goals. There are some that quibble and say we're close, but one country and most people in most audiences won't guess it. It's not Germany with its energy vende. It's not Denmark with its bicycle into wind turbines. It's not Korea with a push on wind. It's Morocco. And that's not something you recognize because Morocco started in, uh, 19, um, in, 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 in 1999 initially to study, and then in 2010 to really put into place an effort to grow their footprint in solar and in wind and in energy storage, in thermal storage, something I'll come back to in a bit. So we are not on pace to do what we've said, but we have at least commitments that get us part of the way to towards that goal. Now, you'll notice the two degrees implies cutting our emissions back roughly to zero, but since then, the climate story has gotten worse and worse, and so thankfully the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said, no, no, this two-degree goal, meaning 80 or more percent emission reduction from your own baseline, that is not enough. Now we need to have a goal of one and a half degrees, and there's lots of good arguments why we can't get there. I think they're wrong, but there is a credible case to make that this ain't going to happen. Um, but this says, of course, you don't have to do any math here to recognize that if that's two degrees, one and a half degrees means we need to go carbon negative. We're still growing in emissions, so this is all pipe dream unless all of these things happen very quickly. But it's a critical statement because it means we not only need to zero out emissions from power plants and from vehicles and from land use change, but we need to invest in some set of things smarter agriculture, better land use management. I have colleagues, I still talk to them a little bit, who want to geoengineer the planet. Um, we don't talk much. Um, but there is, a, there is a, a series of arguments for how to get negative. That is something that 15 years ago was really beyond a pipe dream. So this kind of gives the lay of the land. One and a half degrees, we have to cut our emissions by 95 to 100%. When you're at 95%, I used to be an astrophysicist, we round that to 100, so we need to cut our emissions by basically 100% and then go negative. So my training as a physicist got me involved in a lot of the analysis side of this process, um, but as you heard um, um, in Peck's introduction, I had this opportunity to work for the State Department to really work through some of the opportunities. And so um, under President Obama, I was able to work with Secretary of State Kerry directly as an envoy for science projects um, and partnerships largely in the Middle East and in Africa on clean energy building infrastructure for electric vehicles in places like Nairobi, um, building efforts around sustainable land use planning, a number of efforts, and if you do that, you get a kind of a nice letter at the end. It's certainly in a large frame picture on my wall. Um, but as you heard, we did have a little election in this country, and it didn't go quite the way I wanted. Um, and unfortunately, President Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, and I found this odd because the argument made at the time was that the Paris Climate Accord deal wasn't good enough, which I found a little bit surprising because 
the US and China essentially wrote the Paris climate deal, and we wrote what most people thought was a pretty good deal. It turns out it wasn't as aggressive enough as we've now seen. And so I waited and waited for the new president to demonstrate what that better new deal would be. Um, it didn't come around, and so I did resign, as you heard. Um, and in this, in this era and with this particular president, when you resign, I think that may be too many words. So I wrote a letter that cited Democrats and Republicans about what we should do. Um, I wrote my letter. Um, I don't think anybody read it because I did embed a message um, as an acrostic in the, the paragraphs. That did get read. Um, and what I learned is that one of the many failings of the climate science community is that we are piss poor at communication. There are now a few incredible leaders, Tony Lacerowitz at Yale, um, Greta Thunberg, are doing an amazing job communicating the story, but the science community has not done its job well. If for nothing else, the climate science community went into that meeting in Paris, and they weren't ready to run scenarios that would meet the one and a half degree target. That's a failing that an analytic community cannot make. You can't go in running scenarios for this two degrees, that 80% reduction, when in fact there is some bubbling back communication among leaders and secretaries of state and environment and finance. Maybe we should go more aggressive. And the science community got caught out. There is no other way to call it. Failing number 92 in this process. So I did write my letter, but I did learn from some of these people that if you're going to do this and you want to communicate with my boss, that was uh, Mr. Trump, you have to tweet it out. And you have to tweet it out early in the morning in California so that it's workable early in the morning day here and that people are still at work in Europe. And so I tweeted it out early in the morning. But then they said, well, that's just like the logistics. Then you have to do the important thing. And that is you have to get your best known friend to retweet. That was hard. I was thinking, am I brave enough to ask Draymond Green? No, I'm not going to do that. I thought about, should I ask uh, Governor Inslee? No, I'm not going to do that. So I finally uh, asked the best known person who I know if she would retweet it. <laughs> and she did. And it definitely had the desired effect because by the end of the day, um, I think I was out tweeting, I was out trending Taylor Swift for 19 milliseconds. And so <laughs> you get some of this interesting response. And I say this not to tell just an individual story of kind of what happens here, but for two critical reasons. Because of how much a climate emergency we are in, one of the challenges that we all need to look at, based on our personality type, where we work, there's lots of things. We heard a discussion earlier today. This is something done better by people with tenure than without. I happen to disagree with them, although admittedly I'm not one of the ones without tenure, so easy for me to say. Um, but in my opinion, this is the moment when one really has to make the hard choice. And as an academic, making the hard choice and resigning is OK. It works fairly well. Who it doesn't work well for are all of the people in the federal agencies that you walk away and leave behind. And people in the embassies I work with, people in some of the federal agencies, they don't have that, um, that luxury to walk away. And so one of the challenges is, how do you use leverage to push for something that you know needs to happen and do in a way that can be productive? And I haven't seen a whole lot of productivity in this space in the administration since I left, so I don't think I abandoned too much there. But I do think that the partnerships, and the partnerships I'm inviting the students here in particular to take part in, have really been interesting. So one of the reasons why I was so confident was that way back in the 1970s, when we faced an oil embargo, California and the United States government took divergent paths. United States was growing its electricity use per person, similar to California. In California, we, we faced an oil crisis, and there was an immediate cut in usage of oil, even though we don't run most of the economy on oil, except for vehicles. Um, but what happened after that point, when California established a set of agencies, very similar to what, Mor what, what Morocco did, first in 1999 and then 2010, when they launched their clean effort, was then to double and triple down on energy efficiency at the industrial, at the business, and the commercial level in a series of efforts 
that mean that when I went to college back here when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I didn't take a laptop or a desktop with me. I didn't take a phone. I didn't take any of those things. Now all of you students take tons of stuff. But electricity use in California has remained flat, which economists left and right leaning back in the 1960s said was not possible. There was, in fact, a law, and this is the one university I, I get to say it, and I will get in massive trouble, but you had a very famous anthropologist who coined Leslie White's law that said actually culture grew as the amount of energy consumed grew, something which sounds hopefully silly today. Um, and what we've seen is that these huge transformations are possible. Now, a little bit of this loss, of this difference between California and the United States is actually due to some of the dirty companies left. And the argument is whether it's a fifth or a sixth. So it's not trivial, but it's not the dominant piece of the story. And so this is one of the things that, that armed myself, and my mentors, and my students that you could make these kind of dramatic transformations. The problem is, this has been a slow growing process, and we have given away many too many good decades when we need to get on incredibly rapidly with the job. And that's why I said in the beginning, we cannot make the kind of mistakes we made in the past. We have to move far faster. So the California story is interesting, and I highlight it not just because I'm from California, but because a number of elements of what's happened in California are useful not as whole borrowing whole cloth through different places, but they illustrate a couple features. So California had a economy-crushing energy crisis in 2000, 2001, where with Enron we basically gave away the store because we don't understand either oversight or antitrust, which is pretty sad. Um, but five years later, California passed its climate law, then Assembly Bill 32, which called for us to get um, our emissions back to the 1990 baseline by 2020. It's kind of a gobbledygook of numbers, but it also called for us to meet 20% of our electricity demand in 2010 by renewables, and we failed. We got there in 2013. We threw a little party that we were better late than never. Um, and California's goal for renewables in 2020 is 33%, and we're at 37% today. California's goal for 2030 was 50%, but after the excitement of getting to these goals and seeing the transformation in clean energy that I'll describe in a bit, California went and passed a law, Senate Bill 100, that I worked uh, intensively on for a year with people from environmental groups, Democrats, and Republicans in the California Assembly and the Senate, the lower and the upper branch. And this calls for going to 100% clean energy by 2045 and upping the 2030 goal to 60%. And one particular feature of California's law is that for us, we define renewables as solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, if it's sustainable, that if is a particularly complicated thing, which I won't get into tonight unless it's in the questions. It's something I do a lot of work on myself. Um, but we do not count nuclear, and we do not count large hydro. We do count small hydro, less than 30 megawatts. That's a particular choice. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that on anyone. I'm from upstate New York. Um, New York has similarly aggressive goals, but we count large hydro. Mainly, we get it from Quebec in our mixture. China, we have a number of representatives here, count large hydro and nuclear in the mix. So there are some really critical local differences, but it highlights a process. The other key feature here is that this target, like New York State's target and like New Mexico's target, is all inclusive. We used to think only about getting to these targets for electricity, but we've made the job harder and said this is a goal for all energy, which primarily means we now have to account for massive amounts of transportation-based energy. In California, our driving, our transportation emissions are now over 50% of the state's emissions. So we have some big challenges, but we have an interesting matrix of features. We have this Senate Bill 100, 100% clean energy. We also have a cap and trade system. And we have a bill, Senate Bill 375, which is the playground of academics and planners. 
it says that no city may build something new unless they account for the extra vehicle miles traveled. That's a very complex sort of bill. Um, we have a mandate for a million solar rooftops. When we passed it a decade ago, people said it wasn't possible. We met that goal four months ago. We have a goal by the end of 2020 to have a million electric vehicles on the road. We are at about 600,000. We may or may not make that goal, but it's an interesting challenge. And I'll come back to the feature which I think is the most interesting part of this later on. It's not any of these numbers that I just spewed at you. It's that California has built environmental justice into its climate law. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. One of the interesting features is that we, borrowing a bill from the Netherlands, which actually didn't end up passing in the Netherlands, it passed in part, then it was undone by the more right-wing government. So any Dutch here, we can argue, you have an orange shirt on, so maybe you. Um, so um, California's law now requires by the end of December, no new homes can be built in the state that don't generate as much energy as they need, and you cannot generate from fossil fuel sources. Um, that is an interesting piece. One out of five homes in the United States is built in California. That's something not to be proud of. Um, but this was passed in a way that gave the industry almost 10 years of notice, but they only noticed it about nine months ago, and so there's a scramble. Um, we're getting all kinds of very creative solutions coming up. One housing company has said, well, what if we don't do this on the rooftop, but instead we make it a requirement that when you buy a home, you get a share of a solar or wind farm on the roof of a grocery store nearby or a big box store. So there are some creative ideas coming out of the panic. At the same time we passed this, we also passed one, and we know how to do this. We also passed one we don't know how to do. And that is California also said that office buildings must be net zero energy by 2030. Now whether that's incredible heat pumps or fuel cells with green hydrogen or something we don't know of yet or cold fusion in the basement, this is what I consider lawmakers showing guts. Because the scientists did not say we knew how to do that. And yet that passed the same time as the other one. So this is the kind of challenge we're going to need. Now, the exceptional event and, and the event that why I hope every undergraduate in the room decides they're either going to get a major in C's or they're going to do a co-major or a minor or whatever the various flavors are is because this is now the battle of our time. And while I said the first iconic picture was the one of Obama and Xi shaking hands to this climate deal, the next most iconic picture and the one that should upset everyone's view in a good way of just how slow the energy and climate field needs to be is this amazing picture from 13 and a half months ago of Greta Thunberg in her school strike outside of parliament. Now, this is absolutely phenomenal. I saw the pictures of the protests here. At Berkeley, our protests were here. Um, it was roughly four and a half million people on the 20th of September and it was something on the order of seven million people on the school strike on last Friday. This is absolutely phenomenal and off the charts. And no matter what somebody says about how they predicted it, you know, whether they read Isaac Asimov and they read about the mule and how people can break Harry, all these kind of views about human behavior, this is off the charts. And this is the kind of thing that no matter how cynical one is, should really give you hope that not only can these movements come from interesting places, but they can have action at a scale that almost all of my more senior colleagues said they've seen nothing like since the 1960s. And that's this critical part of the story. So what I want to use the second part of the talk to highlight is what I wrote as part of my, I didn't actually get to attend Berkeley's climate strike. I had to give my spot away because I was at, um, it was in Beijing at a summit around electric vehicles, and I'll come back to that in a bit. But my written comments were really um, highlighted here, and everything I've said so far is really summarized by the climate crisis we now face cries out for an even greater wave of use-inspired um, and applied research, and critically for social activism. We will not get there if we have great ideas and don't translate it, or we won't get there if we have great activism and don't keep bringing new ideas into the market. 
And while a good deal of the work that um, myself and many colleagues do today, for good reason, is around electric vehicles, we have to only go back 10 years to recognize that the in thing for transportation, the big bugaboo of the next piece of our mission story, 10 years ago it was biofuels. And I contributed to that, I'm certainly as guilty as others, in thinking that if we could do biofuels sustainably, it could be part of the story. In fact, I went on 60 Minutes and argued for, if we can get the right metrics in place, there's an option there. That was wrong. And there are sustainable biofuels available in different settings, and there's really interesting groups. The Department of Energy just gave out $75 million today for sustainable biofuels, ranging from algae being grown in ponds to better recycling of urban waste to offtakes of agriculture that do not degrade. There's lots of interesting bits of the story around sustainable biofuels. But one part of the equation is preserving and returning land to nature, and it's very hard to square that circle if biofuels are a big part of the story. Now, that's an area where there's very solid disagreement among very knowledgeable folks, and so that's one of the areas I'll highlight tonight where there's a range of opinions. So what, what, I, what I want to highlight a little bit is this issue of leveraging where we are. And so my own laboratory, I was founded 20 years ago um, to this month when I moved to Berkeley. Um, we had this great fortune to work on some of the climate science that I did in my early days and uh, were involved in the Nobel Peace Prize um, that we shared with Al Gore. A couple thousand scientists, and I see several in the room, one Al Gore, which I think makes the unit of analysis for us micro-gores, but I'll leave that aside. And then work on really innovative ways to get the financing for clean energy on the table. And one of the interesting things is that while you heard in the opening uh, comments by, by Dean Peck, the transformation that's happened in solar. 1979, when that curve started with this incredible um, drop in the amount of sea ice, solar was 50 US cents per kilowatt hour at minimum. And now there are solar power plants being installed in the world, everything from on rooftops of buildings to large arrays in deserts with cost as low as two cents per kilowatt hour. There was a recent project at 1.8 cents, but we ferreted it out, and it turns out there was about 0.2 cents of subsidy built in. Two cents a kilowatt hour, and it was 50. That has changed the entire landscape, and it's changed the landscape in terms of projects in ways that even experts in the energy industry have not caught up with. There are simply ways to think about energy generation adding storage in, thinking about new chemistries that we could not do before. It is a goal, a life-changing situation. And then our laboratory in particular works with a variety of governments. I've just highlighted a couple we work with here, the Moroccan government, um, Kenya, China, um, and Malaysia on clean energy planning, and I'll get back to it in a bit. But before I leave that, I need to highlight one little bit about the, the Nobel Peace Prize thing. So all academics know that Nobel Prizes are great, they like them for the notoriety, they like them for the money, but most academics like them most of all for the parking. Well, at Berkeley, parking is very scarce, and so if you get a Nobel Prize, you get one of these Nobel Laureate Reserve parking places. That's the cat's meow. That's the thing you want to get. And so here we have a line of them. This is actually in front of the astronomy building. Um, the physicist friend of mine, Saul Perlmutter, is up on the corner up here. He has one for the expansion of the universe story um, for, for inflation. And so the four of us on Berkeley campus who shared in this, we were like licking our chops. What are we going to get for this? Year went by, two years went by, three years went by, no Nobel Prize parking. Kind of wondered. And then we got the message um, saying, well, you know, you guys got it for environmental things, and how many of you have electric vehicle back then? And the answer was only one of the four of us, and so it didn't come our way. Eventually, Berkeley did. Those of you who visit Berkeley, you know, you won't see that except for if you come to my office, but you will see the Nobel laureate parking space that we got. <laughs> Notice the fine print, it gets even better. Parking not reserved for IPCC, so anyone welcome, so it really highlights. And I highlight that because not only are we going to have to think about going from combustion vehicles to electric vehicles,
but we're going to have to find ways to do the investment in mass transit or the localized electric scooter revolution, which has run me down several times on campus. Um, and in my case, what it's meant is that our laboratory partners quite extensively. We work with lots of environmental um, NGO groups um, that do everything from microgrids in conflict regions. Energy Peace Partners is a group we work with that does microgrids in South Sudan um, and in Congo. We work with groups that do environmental justice, um, energy efficiency and renewable energy for people who um, can't afford apartments and the employees are generally people who have dropped out of high school or college or coming out of prison. There's a whole variety of social transformations in the process. My lab works with a variety of partners. Um, Indian Yeri is a cook stove company in Rwanda. Virunga is a hydropower company designed to power Africa's oldest national park. Virunga and Goma, the city that's always in the news for bad things like rebels and volcanoes and Ebola. Um, and then a whole variety of nations, and I include the nation state of California because at the current time we're not really friends with DC. Um, and I want to highlight that fairly briefly in the last little bit to kind of pull some of the things together. So one of the interesting features is that thinking about the power system, both for stationary power and increasingly to power electric vehicles or to make hydrogen, is something that the models that most utilities have are decades old because most utilities are decades old and most of their energy uh, planners and designers are many decades old. And so even if they want to be on the forefront of this process that's made solar and wind now the cheapest forms of energy worldwide for new power plants, I say that without footnotes, that's a statement you could not make even five years ago. And energy storage, the fastest improving technology so that if your solar is two or three cents per kilowatt hour, you can add storage at another one to two cents and beat the price of power basically anywhere with base load clean energy, even in colder northern climates. I know your climate quite well. I'm from Ithaca, New York. I appreciate the, uh, the non-California climate. Um, but Germany, which has the solar insulation of Alaska, has for a long time been the per capita leader on solar. So this is not a feature. So in my own case, we work with a variety of governments around the world to build open source models of their power system. That is a loaded statement because most power system models are not available to the public. Utilities have them, a few planning agencies do. But in our case, the effort was to really build on electrical engineering and operations research um, and to build detailed models of energy of the plants, the transmission lines, the high voltage lines, the low voltage distribution, that whole package to plan out and think through opportunities. And what I won't talk about today, because no one wants to hear about this at 6.44 at night, is the planning part of the story. But the kinds of pictures that come out are things like this. So this is a picture across all of Western North America. The black line is the forecast demand. As you can imagine, if you're forecasting demand for 2050, you know you'll be wrong. But this is, a, this is the demand forecast made by the 20 Western states. And the colors are designed to be kind of intuitive. Light blue is wind, yellow is solar, red is geothermal, we have gas and capturing the emissions. Remember I said that, that carbon negative process. And then these negative going spikes down here are energy beyond the demand, whenever the total supply is higher than the black, that go into storage that we bring back out of batteries, of flywheels, of a technology that a company just got licensed in California. I had a visitor from New Zealand, and he came into my office and said, why are you Californians so stupid? I said, excuse me? And he said, well, last time I heard, you are a drought state, and yet you pump water uphill and bring it downhill for pumped hydro, low-cost storage. Why do you pump water when you don't have any? I said, you have a good point. Maybe we are stupid. His company pumps rock uphill. We have lots of rock and brings it back down when the, when the demand is high and generates energy. So that's a clever piece of the story. So we build this switch model, as we call it, solar and wind integrated with transmission and conventional power. I know it's not a perfect acronym, but switch is cool. Um, and we use it in partnership in countries to look at their demand. 
So one of the things that's happened in this energy revolution is that in places like California and now southern Germany um, and Kenya and a variety of places that are generating more and more power from renewables, the net demand curve has changed. The demand curve, as you can imagine, in most places is flat at night because the only people awake are students. Um, and early morning, the demand ramps up. And then in the late in the afternoon, it ramps up even more when offices are on and people come home. So demand curves are kind of flat, and then they peak up in the evening, and so you need to deal with that. Well, the more and more solar you add, you create what's called the duck curve. That five years ago was like Y2K. It was the disaster of the moment. This is the duck curve. So here we have middle of the night, only the few students here are doing whatever they're doing. Um, and that here was the demand curve in the afternoon, and then there was kind of a peak at night. That's the neck of the duck, and then it ramps down. But as we install more and more solar, we hollow out the back of the duck until we have a point where we have very low demand. And so suddenly, we go from a, um, a situation where utility planners, the old style ones, were worried about the end of the day. Now they have to worry about excess power in the middle of the day. Well, that opens up an exciting story. All of that excess power you have here, when the prices go really low and you don't want to sell for electricity, now you can put it into batteries of your electric vehicles, or you can make hydrogen. China, which is now the world leader in, in electric vehicles, they have a goal for 5 million by, the, by 2020. Um, they are now betting on hydrogen for long distance transportation. And so you can make hydrogen here. And in our case, you can basically load shift from there to here by using central storage facilities or by using the battery in your car. And for most of us, our car is our second biggest purchase after our home. So it kind of makes sense to use it for more than just the roughly one hour a day that you drive around. Another feature is that using the switch model, California agreed with us. And so California now has a requirement. Every utility must install storage. And we're doing it now where natural gas in the US is cheap. So there's not a lot of tension over requiring utilities to put in storage. Here is a flow battery, unlike the battery in your phone, that has a few thousand cycles. This is a liquid battery with several million cycles before it degrades. And the utilities are required to meet a fraction of the peak load. It's 2% by 2020. And we're arguing right now with the regulator whether it'll be 4 or 5% by 2024, ramping up the amount of storage so that ultimately we will have this much storage from new technologies to go to that 100% clean energy grid. Now, vehicles end up being a fascinating part of the story. This is the equivalent mile per gallon of the same electric vehicle driven in different parts of the United States based on how clean the energy is. And in the Northwest, we count that large hydro as clean. The salmon aren't happy, but we count it that way anyway. So it's a high mile per gallon. California is a little bit less because we have a mix of other things. But we've got some states, I won't point over here, um, where the numbers are lower still because of the amount of dirty energy remaining in the mix. So now's when the point in the talk when I start to say the uncomfortable, inconvenient truth statements. One of which is that no new natural gas can be built. Period, full stop, done. Here at Michigan, you are building no natural gas. That can't happen unless you know how to suck it out of the air right now at not too big a financial or, or carbon penalty. That plant needs a ring of students protesting it until it's not built. That's an uncomfortable truth, but it's one of the ones that are there. Now, I'll criticize others, myself included, in a bit. So there's lots of blame to go around. But this highlights the interesting leverage point. The cleaner your energy gets, the more miles you get in your electric vehicle or in your electric bus, or the greener your hydrogen is that you make from it for other uses, like industrial, or I heard you have winter here in Michigan, and so you might want some hydrogen for heating. There's a variety of things you can do. But that is the kind of positive feedback that we critically have to have to make this story work. We have to recognize the things you can't do 
no matter how pe much people say, no, 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 this plant, it's not that big, we critically need it, heating is important, students don't like to freeze, neither do faculty, old people really hate to freeze. Um, but this is something that can't happen. And if you make it happen, you have to also recognize that that plant has to be decommissioned in under two decades. And I guarantee no one who builds a gas plant today is going to want it to be decommissioned in two, year, in, in two decades. So it's a harsh truth of the story. The other side of the story is that this interesting mixture between solar in particular and batteries for electric vehicles has had all kinds of interesting other knockoff benefits. And this gets into the last part of the talk, and that is the environmental justice. You'll notice I praised California for having solar on rooftops, and there's just one little problem in that solar rooftop story. You have to own your rooftop. That means any policy that subsidizes solar, which you have an argument to do because we want to get that in the market, is a penalty on the poor to benefit the rich. If you own a home, you're richer than the average, often a lot richer in California. It's crazy in California. Um, so if your policies just subsidize technology but don't subsidize social, you are subsidizing the affluent on the backs of the poor people. And we know this is a long history of this. Khrushchev and others have said for a long time, you know, one of the worst forms of government is to have socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. And that is exactly what we're doing if we don't find ways to not only make solar available to low-income families, to make electric vehicles available so that, for example, Lyft and Uber follow the India model which I don't hear a word about in the United States, but India has said ride-sharing companies must make a certain fraction of those vehicles electric and must make it easier for low-income drivers to get access. I don't hear Lyft and Uber making that shout. Now, we'll see if India makes it happen, but that's the kind of learning we have to do because we're going to have to change this dynamic. That's the Greta Thunberg lesson. And that is that it can't mortgage this on the backs of young people, of minorities, of poor people. But you do get some positive versions. This is uh, one of my students. It's not the one you think. It's actually this one here. He used to be my student, but now he runs Energy Access for Facebook, which I think really means Facebook access for everybody. Um, but here we have a market in Kenya where most of these devices, solar with a small battery and an LED light, whose costs have come down as these technologies have been developed and mass produced, this is a situation where these devices can be taken home now for no down payment because mobile money is so secure in East Africa that it not only has contributed already to more than a 2% increase in GDP through greater efficiency, and a little lower graft, but Kenya, pretty good at graft too, um, but it has enabled people to access energy in ways that couldn't happen before. Now, Kenya is also a battleground for clean energy as well. It's one of the places you saw we're building this switch model. Kenya has the most active geothermal industry in the world today, more active than New Zealand, more active than Iceland, more active than California. We have more installed, but they have a bigger current industry. And right now, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and General Electric are arguing for a coal plant to be built in a UNESCO site on the Kenyan coast when they have the largest wind farm in sub-Saharan Africa, large solar coming on, and all that geothermal. So one of the uses of this switch model was to analyze this process. And the conclusions, instead of building a coal plant in Lamu, and if any of you have been to Lamu, you know it's a beautiful place, um, but here we have a situation where they are not even going to use domestic coal because external coal is cheaper and more reliable to bring it to market. And so there is a battle around this where the Kenyan Supreme Court has now ruled against the coal plant. The only petitioners to build it are unfortunately a overseas Chinese company, part of the Belt and Road Initiative, and General Electric. Um, instead of geothermal and wind and solar. And so it simply does not make sense given this point. Now, I think we're going to win. The Kenyan president just came out of the UN. He was uncomfortably on the panel with Greta Thunberg. Um, and he committed to the low-carbon path. So now we have to hold him to it. 
The next part of the story I won't do in detail, but low renewable energy prices have changed the equation in ways that we're not even fully understanding. Just last week, Science Magazine ran an article highlighting how rethinking our chemical industry in the face of incredibly low prices for renewables, I happen to love the icon they chose here for this process, allowed a rethinking of a whole variety of processes. And while I won't go into, into it today, so we can move into the Q&A, instead of essentially thinking about high pressure, high temperature processes um, to break up hydrocarbons, we could now build from the ground up using carbon dioxide, ironically, water vapor and other molecules, and do low temperature processes that were economically impossible to even consider in the chemical engineering world until we recognize that low cost electricity and green electricity changes the story. And it goes even further. There are fuel cells that run on hydrogen, but there's also higher temperature fuel cells, so-called solid oxide fuel cells. Um, Michigan and Cornell and Caltech are, are some of the leaders in building fuel cells that are at high temperatures so that that heating need is something we could now couple in. So there's lots of interesting things to go. So in my last three minutes, or four minutes, I'll probably steal one from the Q&A, I want to highlight this biggest partnership, go back to this US-China story I talked about before. Our biggest switch modeling team is in partnership with four Chinese universities and with State Grid, which I believe is the world's largest company. It's essentially the Chinese amalgamation of the regulatory group and the builder of uh, transmission and another capacity. And so we're partnering to look at the pathways that would allow China to do this dramatic change, given that China is today the world's largest consumer of coal. So this modeling effort is a big set of projects. And for those who come to the more technical meeting tomorrow, I'll look at some of the details. But one of the things that comes out of looking at the Chinese energy system over the next couple decades is very similar to what I described with electric vehicles. And that is the demand curve for energy during the day can change so much because of clean energy that this idea that you had to meet the off-peak demand, that evening demand for power, may also change. So one of the things that we're finding is that almost all of our analysis and almost all of our mental machinery in the US and Europe, and I would argue in China too, to think about how do we shift a little bit of demand off of peak. That's how we did energy efficiency for decades. Let's get people to not use their, wa their washing machines or their dryers in the evening. We want to shift it to another, to, to late afternoon. We want to shift it to evening or some other time. Lots of clean energy during the day means that we start to get an alignment of we want people to charge up their vehicles during the day when the sun is out. We want people to run industrial facilities when it's windy. And in California, it's not windy during the day. We're windy in the evenings. Midwest, you're, the wind is wonderfully coincident with the middle of the day. So adding some storage, adding um, lots of smart systems so that those tasks that can be shifted, we can now shift them to line up our peaks. And that's something we didn't think about before. So in China, this is a map at the State Grid Electric Vehicle Company control room. This is one of these massive, massive screens. The location of every charging station. When I took this picture off of the screen a year ago, there were 300,000 charging stations, 2.3 million electric vehicles. I think that China is now over 3 million electric vehicles. And one of the features that anyone with a kind of a nice operations research or physics background wants to do is then go analyze the process and model. And so one of the things I'll show you here is a simulation of New York City. And this is assuming every electric vehicle in New York City overnight is an electric vehicle. And if I can get the video to run, which I'm not sure of, what you'll see is from midnight to 3 p.m., so the nighttime when it's quiet, and then the rush hour, um, you'll see every red dot's a taxi cab with a passenger. Every blue dot is an empty one. And then the green circles that will appear will be how many vehicles are at the charging stations. And if I can get this to work, there they go. So middle of the night, here they all are. They're charging up late night because in New York State, you have hydro around the clock from Quebec. So people charge up in upper Manhattan. 
and then rush hour, and they all flood into the city, and they go kind of crazy like uh, taxis do. And then as rush hour ends, we'll identify where the optimal locations for charging are. And that's a fascinating version of figuring out where to have charging stations, but also informing the drivers so they can go do it at the right time of day. So this gets into how much making our system smart can really transform this story. And as you look across the country, this is kilowatt hours used around the country, color coded by, um, by the amount. Um, a couple of the borders are artificial. They're due to utilities, don't report the same numbers on both sides of a state border, even though the utility moves over the edge. This is natural gas. Consumption around the US, all of that has to go or to be offset entirely. Goods that we buy, and if I don't give someone epilepsy, I'll toggle between goods and services here. It's more or less a map of the cities. And for those of you with eyes that are less than 30 years old, you'll notice that most of our cities look like kind of reverse pimples. Well, those pimples are a function of the fact that the people who live in the most expensive areas in inner cities tend to have smaller places. A larger fraction of them don't have cars. Portland is a city with the lowest car ownership in the United States. Manhattan has a really relatively low ownership as well. Um, and it gives you a mapping of the carbon footprint, not just of the city center, but of the entire area. Now, in this map, San Francisco, New York, and Dallas um, have all won climate awards, generally by cheating generally by defining the award for just the city center and leaving the suburb of someone else's problem. That is not an okay way to do things, and it's part of this kind of cheating. So I mentioned that, um, that we are seeing some dramatic changes, and I couldn't show you the video for Shenzhen uh, in southern China because they said we may not show it because they want to show it the first time at the climate conference, I think to impress Greta Thunberg. But Shenzhen has committed to a 100% electric vehicle fleet for their taxis, just like I showed you for New York. And now Chengdu, the capital uh, in Sichuan province, is going the same direction. So we have a partnership to manage all the data for all 22,000 taxis. And something I won't get into here is the details of how much savings you can get by charging them smartly. And so what just give you an eyeball figure, these are the taxis and their charging stations today. But if we optimize where people go to charge by giving more information to the drivers, you can see how much we drop off in the total amount of energy. Remarkable savings by leveraging clean vehicles. Now the last thing I want to say is that I've highlighted what you might describe as the supply side story tonight. I've highlighted going to green energy and how we shift that at the, at the larger technical and policy level. But in the end, every economist knows that if you want to make a big change, it's the demand side where change can happen often. When Burger King and demand for an impossible burger changes um, in response to young people's diets, um, you get a big change. So one of the things that we've built is the carbon footprint tool that went into making those national plots. So this is the version of that tool. There's a version that doesn't have Berkeley in the name, if that annoys you. You can download an app for your phone where you can look at your own footprint and compare it to your neighbors. And you can define neighbors by people who live near you or people who are the same size families as yours. And so we use this in competitions across California, um, across Sweden, we did one in Germany. We're working on one for Korea right now um, to do a carbon footprint analysis so you can see what is your biggest feature. Is it energy for your home? Is it your diet? Are you a vegan, vegetarian, vampire, or whatever the diet might be? Um, and the feature which I thought was just a throwaway. So this is the, um, the research version of the website. It's not the super fancy pretty one. But here we have something where you go through, you say who you are, can we save the data or not? Can we save it anonymously or not? Um, and at the end, after you tell all your dirty secrets about buying and shopping, it then spits out at the end what your carbon footprint is. But also, 
a list, a rank ordered list of the things you didn't do that would save you on carbon and what the financial cost or penalty would be. And this ends up being the most interesting page. We have people who want to receive a email or a text reminder, never, once a month, once every six months, where we qu query them to say, did you do what you said? In this house, this person committed to buying a more efficient vehicle. We sent them a message later on. We checked off on their carbon footprint when they bought that more efficient vehicle. And so this kind of behavioral side of the story is ultimately the driver that we're going to need if we want to get these products more broadly into people's use. And I can't say that strongly enough. We know on the supply side how to decarbonize our electricity, our transportation. We do not yet know how to deal with international trade that will meet various trade rules, although there's some places they're trying. But the lever that we have done almost nothing with is behavioral economics, consumer choice, and the kind of mass movements that we are now seeing with the student-led extinction revolution, the climate strikes. So I want to end there because there's nothing in my view more valuable than figuring out what our own numbers are and take it from there knowing that we have now made this into a sprint, but we are armed much better with tools than we might have thought, although the thorny questions around gas, around nuclear, around geoengineering, around international trade all have to happen. And so I want to thank you for the chance to talk tonight, and I look forward to the questions and the conversations with the dean. All right. Thank you. Thank you, my man. All right, if we have questions, you can line up at the microphones. I think Dan and I are just going to sit up front and tweet. <laughs> I've got nothing to resign um, from anymore. <laughs> that was a great talk. Um, and I definitely want to allow the uh, assembled audience to ask questions. So we'll just alternate as long as there's someone at both sides. Want to start over here? Hello, my name is uh, Larry Borm. I'm a first year at the C's, graduate student. Uh, I heard that you, um, you started as astrophysics, is that correct? That so, is true. Yep. So I also did physics in my undergrad, and I was curious, how did you uh, transfer into <laughs> clean energy and uh, technology in that? So in my case, um, my undergraduate career was all designed around being an, becoming an astronaut. And physics and learning to fly and having a, a sport or two was kind of the root of the time. But then I did the NASA vision test. It didn't go so well. <laughs> And so I went into physics, but um, the, the real need at the time was climate models and understanding the dynamics, and physics is a good start for that. And so for me, it was kind of a, a very fun and easy transition, but it wasn't planned. And I'm definitely jealous about young people today because I was not aware about programs um, like you have in C's or like the one I now direct at Berkeley they were, they were few and far between. And now the question is, which of the paths do you take, not is there a path? And so I'm, you guys have it good. You may not think so, but you have it good. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. Larry Junk, I'm a professor. Uh, you gave an outstanding talk about supply side especially, but also demand side, and also politics emphasizing the youth movement. Yeah. My question is about what kind of economic systems could get things moving fast? Would it be yeah. something like a carbon fee and dividend system as per citizens climate lobby, cap and trade system, government regulations? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of all of the above, which I know doesn't sound, it sounds pretty mealy-mouthed, but Carbon tax works in some places, not so many, but a couple. Cap and trade is what we have in California. Fee and dividend is the one that, in my sense, makes the most sense at a time when we need to make environmental justice cent central to this effort and making low-income people whole in a process where rich spend a tiny fraction of their money on energy and poor spend a lot makes the most sense to me. But I actually think that the choice of which mechanism is best sorted out not by what's the best ideal policy, it's by best what works in your area. And that varies a lot. Some places are their own central bank, some places are not. 
But the feature which I think is the most important bit of the economics is not how you price carbon, which we need to do, and arguably we need a social cost of carbon, so it's not just the straight carbon, it's the larger impacts, but it's something else. And that is that no matter how cheap I tell you, I tell you that solar or energy storage or any of these things are, they all lose out to fossil fuels unless the financial system recognizes that there's an inherent difference between a technology that you buy up front, no matter how inexpensive, versus one like a natural gas power plant, where you spend roughly 30% of the cost up front, and the remaining 70 is an invisible stream of cost down the road that no one who builds it and no one who's in office has to worry about. That is adults eating off the plates of, chi of kids. And so unless we change the financial system, even as slightly as to say, we want a green bank like Connecticut and New York have, and we will give people loans for energy efficiency or for renting an apartment that comes with these things, and we will prioritize that over fossil fuel and dirty infrastructure investments. And so from my mind, it's the second question that's the critical one. And the thing that I kind of teased in the talk but didn't highlight is that the feature of California's law that I like the best is not this target, uh, how much renewable energy, how much this and that. It's that California committed to spending 35% as a floor, so 35% or more, of all of our cap and trade revenues must be spent on environmental and socially disadvantaged communities. And I'd love if there's a sociologist, somebody who knows another place in the world that has baked environmental justice into their climate law. It's the only one I know of and in 10 years, if we haven't totally wrecked the planet, I predict that's the feature that we'll look back on and we say in California, that's what we're most proud of. So long answer, but great, great question. Hi, my name is Doug Noe, and I'm a dual degree student with C's and uh, Ross School of Business, a master's student. Mm -hmm. And my question pertains to a lot of what you just talked about with um, energy justice and also um, market mechanisms around current pricing for fossil fuels versus renewables. So in Michigan, unfortunately in this day and age, it's not baked into the price of carbon. And so the cost for natural gas and even coal in a lot of ways are cheaper than renewables plus storage, which is kind of the only alternative to that as a base load. What are your thoughts on how that can be resolved? And what is some of your pushback when you hear from DTE yeah. or U of M when they say, we need natural gas because it is the cheapest alternative and Without that, you would increase prices for low-income consumers who cannot afford to pay more for electricity. Right. And so with renewables, it's just not feasible. Can you provide some pushback for that argument? Yeah, so I mean, of course, I, I hear that every now and then, right? So that's a, so I mean, I actually think that all we need to do is to do something that the G19 already committed to and the US has not yet backed out of. And that is, we subsidize fossil fuels today to at minimum a half a trillion dollars, and by some of the investments, five trillion dollars per year. That makes the subsidy for fossil fuels alone vastly larger than the global renewable energy and energy efficiency industry. And so if we just did what we've already signed on to do, this is a done deal. And the biggest argument I, I think, so I don't think the financial argument holds weight, because any long-term assessment is going to be one where there will be a carbon price, even in the Wyoming's, even in Shaanxi province, although the Shaanxi province will have theirs in January. Um, so for me, the feature that has more weight is the thermal issues, not the need for fossil fuels. But every place is gonna to have to do its own calculus for how it does heating. Now I've highlighted in the talk what I view as something that anybody can do high temperature fuel cells plus a combination of geothermal and heat pumps in my view mean that even the most thermally intensive industries have a natural route. But the argument you made is totally valid until we do what we committed to do, which is to either tax the fossil fuels explicitly or simply remove the subsidy. And almost every, there's one, argue, there's one analysis I've seen, it comes from the Cato Institute, that disagrees, but everything else 
there is more jobs in renewable energy and energy efficiency per dollar spent per megawatt than there is in the fossil fuel area. So if you wanted something to retool around, you've got a, a big win right there. And so to my mind, it, you know, I, I say it's a simple story, but of course, baked in subsidies are never simple. But we just need to, to do what we've already committed to do. And I think even in Michigan, even in Alaska, that argument goes away, because these other technologies are available for the thermal loads we have. Thank you. Great question. Hello, my name is Jim. I'm a recent U of M alum, and I now work in the transportation sector. And I'd like to okay. echo your comments on the importance of deploying electric vehicles to decarbonize transportation. Now, with that deployment will come uh, a need for focusing on the upstream impacts. Now, you might be thinking I'm going to be talking about electricity sourcing, but in fact, I'd like to focus on where we'll get the raw materials. Uh, recent uh, studies by analysts have shown there will be a gap between supply and demand by 2025 for raw materials such as lithium, cobalt, and nickel. There's also human rights potential impacts yeah. on that. So my question is how are we going to decarbonize the transportation sector if we have some of these raw material constraints? Right. And I, I would extend that. I mean, the transportation story is the same story as your phone. And so those at the conference today on, on, on US and China heard this remarkable talk by Tom Gradle, kind of one of the pioneers in life cycle analysis, highlighting how many of those rare earths and other materials are in devices we take for granted. Right? So in California, People buy laptops and cell phones and electric vehicles at not lower but higher rates than the rest of the country. And baked into the cost of all of these devices in California is a fee, which is idea we borrowed from BMW, and it's a recycling fee. And it's specifically for these materials. Now, there's, for this, there's a lot of footnotes. The recycling fee for tungsten and terbium and all manner of things and cobalt doesn't actually mean the molecules in your phone. It means they have to account for the equivalent amount being recycled. So that is arguably a pale version of what you're asking for, but putting a market price on these products is the first step. And if we value children's lives, and I mentioned in the talk that I work in the Congo, where it turns out that not only is a lot of these materials come from, as many people know, but something I didn't realize, so I started working there, is that the largest group of smelters of these materials are women. Men were involved in a lot of the civil wars, so women's smelters is a thing in the Congo. And so a number of companies like Google, and you saw we're a partner with them, they have a conflict-free materials policy, and that means paying more to source elsewhere, but it also means trying to invest in these communities. So that is not a perfect solution, and all of the industrial ecologists in the room know that just by putting a price on it and not recycling the materials is not enough, but it's a start. And so from my view, building up the price for these materials is the first step in getting that life cycle cradle to grave process going. So I would say this is one of the big challenges, but batteries have something going for them, and that is that like solar, battery technology is diverse. There's lithium ion, there's nickel metal hydride, there's flow batteries, there's flow batteries without metals, there's a whole variety of routes. And one of the reasons why solar got cheap which is the title of a book of a, of a wonderful uh, faculty at Wisconsin. I'm sure I can mention that. You haven't played them yet, have you? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, you no, have played we them. We didn't play them, did we? Okay. So Greg Nemet wrote a book called Why Solar Got Cheap. And part of it is scaling up manufacturing in Malaysia and in particular China. But part of it is that it's not one technology, one trick. And if we discover we're running low on one and we have a price, we will push research and deployment into the other areas. So I'm actually not as concerned as some of my colleagues are about these potential bottlenecks for cobalt and things, as long as the industry stays diverse. And that doesn't happen if you have just a Tesla. But now with Tesla and BYD um, and a whole variety of companies, it's easier to diversify. But I do think this is one of the big challenges for the next couple decades. And that's why material science is going to be central to this effort. So. Thank you. 
Yes. Uh, I'm Denise Malterol. I'm a professor at Princeton visiting for the U.S.-China conference that we're all attending, or um, that we're both attending. And um, I'm totally, of course, on board with the idea of a renewable future. I think that the story that you're telling, if we could make it come to pass, would be a fantastic future for the planet. But I'm wondering how we go from where we are with coal power plants around the world to a renewable future. And so I'm wondering what your views are on carbon capture and storage, which is something that's been researched quite heavily and deployed very little, right. um, and whether you think that putting a price on carbon would be sufficient to catalyze that, or if there's some more technological stimulus that's needed, or if it's really just not part of the equation, or if it's really a major part that we need to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it underground, because right now the trajectories are going up far too fast for us to, yep. as you point out, meet a two degree target, let alone a one and a half degree target. Yeah, so this is one of the areas where I would say, you know, thoughtful people trying to do good can have a legitimate disagreement, not one that's based on, oh, I think sea level rises because rocks falling into the ocean, as was actually said in DC recently. Um, but my view is very dim on carbon capture. And some people have a very strong argument why it's gonna be a key part of the future. I think there is one version or two, depending how you wanna count it, of carbon capture that makes massive sense. And that is the efforts to do huge amount of not just tree planting, but tree management and vastly smarter agriculture. I would like to see what, what Go Governor Inslee said before he dropped out of the presidential race, that we should be paying farmers to do carbon farming and to put carbon back into the soil. I think that's a critical part of the story. And I don't want to say no research on, on carbon capture and storage, and arguably carbon capture and use might be something which I'm a little happier with, but we do not have examples today of carbon capture at the fossil fuel scale that didn't also extend or encourage fossil fuels. Now that's not what many of the companies want to do, but when you look at the actual companies, carbon engineering and others, they say, well, I'll make this deal with the fossil fuel industry to get myself started, but then of course I'll wean myself later on from that. And I think that is something that is hiding from the truth. We are likely, I would argue, almost invariably going to need carbon capture, but we know enough technically how to do it now and reasonable research programs will move us ahead. But every dollar over the next decade or two that's not spent on energy efficiency, on diversifying into renewables, is a dollar which I would say is misspent in the near term. Now, this is, again, an area where people will violently disagree. But I don't see that as a viable investment, except in the cases where you're capturing carbon without tying yourself to the fossil fuel industry, and you're doing it into a product that itself makes sense. Just burying carbon looks to me like a loser compared to the clean energy path. But, you know, this is can of worms topic number one. So opinions are going to vary on this one. Thanks, Denise. Hi, um, Sanjay Shrivalab, a uh, PhD student at the Department of Computer Science. So I have a quasi philosophical question. So, um, uh, carbon tax, cap and trade, so these are policies that uh, uh, kind of let the directive flow from top to, top to bottom. So uh, the, the directive flows from the government to the citizens. Um, so what do you think about, or have you heard of any initiatives uh, where uh, the initiative is more uh, from bottom to the top? For example, making people more climate conscious. So this is... This is somewhat important because you need a climate conscious electorate to elect a climate conscious government which can in turn institute climate conscious policies. So have you heard of any of such initiatives? Yeah, so I mean, th th this, is, this is a fascinating, right? This is not just a talk, but kind of seminars and teach-ins and all kinds of things. The European, largely European-led thought process around degrowth is a fascinating example of thinking through a future that doesn't require this kind of 3% or 4% or 8% economic pegging a year and allows you to think differently about the, this process. In my hometown, Ithaca, New York, we have something called, it, we had, it's now uh, defunct, but we had Ithaca Hours. H 
parenthesis, O-U-R-S. And the idea was, whether you're a brain surgeon or collecting garbage, your value is the time you put in. It is not the fact that you were advantaged enough to go to fancy medical school and become a neurosurgeon. So Ithaca hours were tradable units of currency that were primarily used to start in the farmer's markets, but then the <laughs> banks agreed to accept them. And they were a way to value people's work, not value people's social advantages. Not that some poor people didn't become great brain surgeons and, and PhDs, but the, there is a strong bias towards your background. And so this is part of this broader discussion about what can you do ground up. But the, the kind of the core statement you mentioned is I think the critical one. And it's not that everyone needs to kind of learn the climate science and memorize every page of the IPCC. It's that the areas where we're making anti-community choices need to be clear. If we choose to subsidize fossil fuels, we need to recognize, no matter what you say about it, it greases the wheels and this and that, it is making not the 1%, but the tenth of 1% fabulously rich, and it's a subsidy we all pay. And there are aspects of that equation that we can just say that's the way they are, and the rich control the economics. That, you know, that argument, I would say the Greta Thunberg experience is the most recent version of we don't have to do it that way. And the 60s, for all of its imperfections, were another version of we don't have to do it that way. But what you've highlighted is kind of, as you're right, it's much more the philosophical. But I think it underscores, it's not that you have to be socialist or Marxist or this or that. You have to recognize how the financial systems work. And in any of the systems we've seen around the world, there are alternatives. But much easier said than done. Right. So great and very difficult point. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kendall, um, and I have two questions. One is at the sort of larger policy level, and the other is more at the individual level. So I graduated last year with NCs with a focus in restoration ecology, mm -hmm. and you mentioned using like planting trees and different agricultural techniques to sequester carbon. Um, I know you said that that might not be the most effective way in the short term, but where do you see that playing a part in the long term? And my second question on the more individual level is there's this sort of assumption, I think, amongst folks who aren't necessarily climate skeptics, but are more kind of like, eh, right. as the, well, if I recycle, nobody else around me is recycling, that sort of argument, right? So how do we affect folks' individual behaviors, in your opinion? Love to hear about that. Ooh, boy, both those are both tough. Um, so, I mean, the tree story, I kind of tried to highlight it um, when Denise asked her question, because in my view, there is only upside to not just replanting forests, but reinvesting in forests. And we keep finding all kinds of neat pieces of ecology. You know, one of the most destructive aspects of tropical forest issue has been the rush due to demand in Europe and the US for palm oil. I work in Malaysia. Turns out that if you simply abandon palm oil and plant and, and scatter seeds, palm oil plantations look like incredibly bad monocultures. But if you get them out of management, they have enough useful biomass that Secondary forests can regrow in former palm oil areas much more quickly than ecologists thought two decades ago. Now, if you don't let them go, you don't get there. So there are some interesting opportunities on the ecology side. And certainly reinvesting in forested land, China has just made a remarkable commitment to sustain and increase the amount of reserves. That's really, you know, it's hard in the US, but it's an incredible challenge in China. Um, these are the kinds of efforts that I think play into this. And this recent paper that got played wrong in the press, it was a call for one trillion trees to be planted. And that's fabulous. And so you know, we've, had, we've seen efforts around this, and then part of the press got it and said, well, planting trees, that's the, we do that and we're done. Right. <laughs> Not right. But it plays into this, we want to reinvest in the landscape. We need to to go back in these areas. So I think that's, that's part of it. And then the second question of kind of making it immediate and, 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 and you know, personal, 
I certainly think that things like these carbon footprint calculators, but not done in the kind of the academic setting. There's an interesting company called the Good Guide. And Good Guide started out uh, with your cell phone, you scan a product in the store, or the barcode, and it will tell you about human rights abuses and various features, but it's now become one of the interesting ways to very quickly do kind of carbon footprint. And you discover that, you know, two versions of, I can't remember if oatmeal is a trade name or not, but I think oatmeal is not, but Quaker Oats is. But, you know. So, you know, you can scan products and you see remarkable differences in the carbon content because of sourcing and choosing the low carbon inputs. And so there are interesting ways to get there, but I do think that, you know, the ultimate version is the idea of having stickers on your car and stickers on your appliances and the energy guide is a very 1960s version of something that now can be much more intuitive with our, our connection to technology. And so there really are ways to make your carbon choices, your water choices, your impact on rare species much more visceral um, than we have chosen to do so far. And that would be, for me, one of the starts. So Thank you. It's a neat question. Hello, Professor. My name is Yabin. I'm first year PhD student at CIS. I have a question regarding the energy resource distribution. That I understand the situation that the country like Morocco or like Spain or like the California, they have sufficient sunshine every year, or like Denmark, they have a wind resource, which is great. Right. And so that makes them possible to build sufficient amount of wind farm or solar farm to to generate electricity, but for some countries like Norway or Sweden or like in, in Finland or like in Michigan, that there's no enough sunshine, which requires extremely large amount of land using for the solar panel or like not only PV, uh, not only rooftop PV, but also the CSP plant, something like this. So um, what's your thought on this and how do the North countries deal with right. these energy resources right. problems? So Thank I'm you. Finnish. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm a Laplander. Um, and okay. Scandinavia, you're right, does not have the world's best sun resource, but they have a far better hydropower resource, very good geothermal, and onshore and offshore wind are transformative, right? So Norway is selling its hydro as the green battery of Europe. Mm -hmm. We in California would disagree a little bit in terms of salmon and, and, nutrition, and, 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 and um, nutrients in the water, but you know, offshore wind is now at a price point where people only five years ago were projecting we wouldn't get to until 2030. The new GE 12 megawatt deep water wind turbines, 400 feet tall, mean that I would argue no coastal place doesn't have the option. And by coastal, I also mean with great lakes nearby, so I don't think Michigan has much of a, of a case against. Plus geothermal, plus heat pumps, plus et cetera. There are certainly some countries that, due to a you know, kind of unfortunate situation of latitude, Malaysia tried to claim this. They said, well, East Malaysia, Sarawak, this actually means an area that doesn't have much wind, but they happen to have great geothermal, great sun. And so I actually have not come across a place they can legitimately say, and that's one reason why we build this switch model, where you know, open source, let's look at the resources, but that doesn't mean that utilities and planners are always ready to do it, right? So I would say that's the bigger challenge. But, but Michigan, no challenge. Yeah. All right, you. so heard <laughs> I heard that loud and clear, and now what we have to do is go out there and make sure the state government allows this um, and incentivizes it. We're out of time. Um, and we've gone for a really long time here, almost two hours. Um, and I'm sorry we can't keep going. Uh, we have another um, event we have to go to. But if you tweet, I'm happy to, if it's not, you know, a rant tweet, but so a short one, I'm happy to try to respond back. Um, I don't always get to it within a day, but I'll try to bounce them back. Yeah, and I would be fascinated if you just, <laughs> if you feel like uh, yeah. putting my Twitter handle in there too so I can he okay. be a part of this. Um, we really got to figure this out, and this is a huge resource sitting next to me. So I want to thank him. Uh, thank you for all going the distance. Yeah, this is long. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much.